Well, welcome to the winter feeding series again. This week, we're going to talk about utilizing winter annuals. My name is Terrell Davis, and I am the Ag Agent here in Pike County with the University of Arkansas Division of Ag Cooperative Extension Service. A couple of objectives for today's um, topic is that we would identify gaps in the current grazing system that you have on your operation. Uh, to identify cool season grasses that can be utilized to fill in those grazing gaps. And then also to consider uh, planting methods, dates, and yield data when choosing potential grasses that you might want to um, add to your uh, pastures for the winter. So kind of where we want to start today when we start talking about cool season annuals, uh, number one is that we just have to develop a plan, a forage plan, um, and you always start by evaluating what you have. And we'll talk about some of these things in, in more depth in just a second, but we always have to have a forage plan. So we really need to decide now, what is our forage plan going to look like for the rest of the year? So winter is coming up on us. So if you don't have a forage plan now, here's a good chance to go ahead and start. Uh, we always plan for forages uh, season ahead of time. So Hopefully you've already got something in place for winter uh, feeding systems, uh, whether that be hay or you've got some cool season annuals planted. And if you don't have cool season annuals planted, maybe today we'll um, identify maybe if that would be of um, help to you or not. May not even uh, provide economic uh, reasoning behind that. Identify weaknesses or gaps throughout the year. So we probably all have some kind of weakness in our program that we currently have. Uh, sometimes it's just the way that things are and there's not a lot we can do about it. It doesn't mean that you're doing it wrong, uh, but sometimes if we just identify those, then we can do the pros and the cons and decide whether it's something that's worth uh, the extra effort of, of filling in that gap. I always say start with the soil test. Uh, I have a lot of folks that want a generic uh, recommendation for fertility or what have you. It's not a cop out. It's just very hard to give you a good generic uh, fertility recommendation when I don't know what is there. I don't want to give you a recommendation when you're spending money that you shouldn't have. And I also don't want to give you a recommendation when it's not quite as potent as you need and you're not going to get the bang for your buck. Um, and I think that pH is where we really still start out with fertility. And so it's really not going to matter that you put that fertility out there if your pH is wrong. And what we really may need is just uh, lime to increase the pH and then see what available nutrients are actually there. Uh, so then after we get our recommendation, we apply the fertilizer and lime according to that recommendation. Uh, and if you can't afford all the lime at one time, sometimes we get back a really big lime request. Uh, most of the forages that you're going to grow, warm season or cool season, um, kind of a six is where we're going to. So in warm season, really about a 5.8 is as low as we can go. I get a lot of uh, soil tests back in our area, um, even into the low fours. I've seen as low as 4.5, but Really that 5.0 to 5.8 range is where I see a lot of these uh, fields at. So if you get a recommendation and it's telling you, um, you know, a couple of tons of lime per acre, I know that can get expensive and it might not be something that you have budgeted in. I want you to uh, keep this in mind. Uh, when you cut that rate, you're never going to catch up with that. And, and honestly, you're wasting your money. So never cut the rate, always count, cut the amount of land that you're doing at full rate. So if you've got 100 acres and you can only afford for 25 of those acres to be at that high rate of lime, then do those 25 acres. And next year, budget to do the next 25. And eventually you'll get them all. Uh, but never cut the rate of actual lime that you put out. That lime um, so low lime this year plus low lime next year, it, those two layers are never going to meet up and you're really never going to do yourself the good that you could by cutting the rate of land and not cutting the rate of lime. Uh, phosphorus and potassium can be applied before the growing season. They will stay in the stool and, and be there and ready to go when you need them. Nitrogen, on the other hand, should only be applied in the season that it's going to be utilized. 
apply, apply it early so that it can be utilized by those plants that you're planting. Uh, but do not put uh, a nitrogen application out in the fall and you're not going to really need it until say the ryegrass is growing in February or March. It may have dissipated by then and you've really wasted your, um, your money. Now I have a lot of people who use uh, chicken litter and so they say, well, I really have that choice. And I, I get it when I can get it. Totally understand that. You're still going to get the phosphorus, you're going to get the potassium, you're going to get the organic matter that you've added to it. But know that you may have to supplement that with some nitrogen closer to growing season time. This is a uh, chart that I, I, or a graphic that I always really like, and I want you to really take this in. So uh, we'll just go from the season that it starts with into winter. So it starts with spring on this graphic. And we know that in spring, we have several different options. Uh, I've got a lot of guys here in Pike County that actually have a pretty decent stand of fescue. Utilize it. Um, that's, that's your best friend at that point in time. Uh, orchard grass is becoming more popular, so it might be something that you want to seed into your operation. Annual ryegrass is fairly cheap. It's easy to plant, so it's a great option that we might be able to utilize. Uh, we're going to talk about small grains a lot today and also clovers as we go through, but that's kind of our arsenal for the spring. Then June uh, comes along and we get into summer grasses. So obviously we have our warm season grasses such as Bermuda grass, uh, crab grass, other native warm season grasses that we might have. Uh, those are things that we can utilize. Uh, always just see what you have. It's way easier to utilize what you have and make it its maximum than to try to restart all over. Uh, just because you have your mindset on an improved Bermuda in your pasture, uh, it may not ever work out in the end. And we all work on a budget. So maybe you've got decent common Bermuda and we just need to work on the fertility so that we maximize it. Uh, Sudan grass and millets are annuals that we can use. Um, and then annual lesbodiza might be an option too. If you have small ruminants, lesbodiza is uh, very needed. So, you know, if, if that's something that you have a multi-grazing uh, situation, then it might be something that you really like. Otherwise, I don't have, really have a lot of people who plant lesbodiza. Uh, then we go into the fall season. So obviously anytime we stockpile, uh, we've got some forages there that are actually the cheapest that we're gonna have all year long. Stockpile, stockpiled forages are the cheapest route for us to go in the fall and even into the winter. Uh, so our fescues is something that we can use then. We don't have to really worry about those issues of getting too hot because we're cooling down. Uh, so that might be something that you wanna use. Once again, that orchard grass can be utilized. Our clovers can be utilized. Uh, that stockpile Bermuda grass or possibly some other warm season grasses that you have. Uh, just notice that timeline that about mid-December or so, you really need to have used warm season grasses up if you're going to stockpile. At that point, uh, the, the moisture and the temperatures just really uh, get to go in and the microbial activity on those um, dormant uh, grasses, break them down, the leaves shatter, and you're not going to have the nutrition that you really need. But uh, in September, October, November, they're excellent uh, sources of, of uh, nutrients. So if you've got a field that's got a fence on it, I highly encourage you just to stockpile it. Don't cut it, bell it, and put it up because that's just adding cost. Allow those cows to be the harvesters. Uh, and then we've got forage brassicas, which we will talk about a little bit today too. Uh, really uh, a good way to utilize um, some forage, and you also add some organic matter back into the soil. And then last, we have our winter uh, grazing. So if we have stockpiled fescue, fescue will last all winter long. Uh, and, and we're not going to talk about stockpiling today in this lesson, uh, but remember that stockpiled fescue, uh, try to cut it uh, the 1st of August, and then apply about 60 pounds of nitrogen on it and let it grow, and then you should be able to graze it well into um, all through winter. And I, I would let it go because you're probably going to want to eat your stockpile Bermuda grass first. Um, in, in a lot of our pastures here in Pike County, 
Uh, you probably just have some native fescue in some wetter areas and then some Bermuda in other areas. Uh, so just kind of use what you've got. If you're stockpiling Bermuda, go for it. If you're stockpiling fescue, uh, the same thing, just utilize it and make it your friend. Some grazing rules. And I think everybody should know, um, and a lot of these came from Dr. Jennings, who many of you know is our forage specialist here at the University of Arkansas uh, Division of Ag. Uh, so one of those is just to inventory what you have. Not only the forages, but especially the forages, uh, but also look at your herd. What size of herd do you have? Uh, do you have a larger framed animal, something with some Brahma influence, beef master, uh, even Charlay? Uh, those are a larger frame animal and obviously when you've got a larger animal there's a bigger belly and there's going to be more forage need to be taken up that is critical to when we're doing forage planting so you look at your herd what do you have do you have medium to small frame cattle well obviously we don't need as much forage there uh, look at your soil again a soil test is very important and water is a very important component that a lot of people don't think about. Do you have some natural sources of water or are they all artificial? Is this something that we're gonna to have to look and see, is there enough watering tanks? Are the watering tanks in the right positions? Uh, so anyway, take an inventory of all these types of things. I think that's a great place to start. And then take care of what you have. So if you've got um, a mix of crabgrass and Bermuda grass in your pasture for your animals to eat. Hey, that works. So let's go with it. Um, it's going to be way more economical to make that stuff work than it would be to do a spray smother spray, get rid of this stuff, and then try to plant something back in its place. Um, that, that takes a lot of money and effort. We don't have a lot of resources for like sprigging around here. So we've almost always got to do seeded varieties. That takes a lot of time and expense. You're going to be out probably a grazing year if you do that. Um, so let's just take care of what we've got. Let's look at the fertility. You know, if it's a hay field, that's another um, scenario that, that you want to really improve that. But as far as a pasture goes, what we're gonna have is probably gonna take care of us. Uh, rotational grazing, is that something that's that's needed? And I think we need to look at stocking rates. You know, that's a big problem that I see is that we have overstocked and uh, our grass just cannot keep up. A lot of those people don't have a weed problem. That's not it. Um, but between being overstocked and being under uh, fertilized, you know, that grass is doing all that it can and rotational grazing is not going to help us much there. In Arkansas, we recommend about three acres per animal unit as far as just continuous grazing goes. Uh, so if you're doing that, you know, there's probably not a lot more better than we can do um, as far as just a continuous grazing situation goes. So Rotational grazing has its place. I'd love to talk to you about it if that's something you're interested in. Let's look at our nu nutrition. Have we hay tested? We know what we're feeding. And then we need to fill in the gaps with those complementary forages that we have available that we're going to talk about today. Always plan one season ahead. Um, that's, that's very important that we're ready to go most of the time. If we're uh, planning a cool season annual, we're going to have to order that seed. We're going to have to make sure that our uh, fertilizer is ready to go. Obviously pH is already needed to have been set. So we really have to plan ahead for that season. And then let's record what happens. It may be something that you don't want to do again. And that's just farming. It's trial and error. Sometimes it works for us. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, if it doesn't work for you, then what went wrong? All those things we can see in our records. But records are our way to reflect back on the end of that season and what worked and what didn't work. And you may know before the season's over, but um, it's kind of probably what you have to be committed to. So why would we use annuals instead of hay? So in the graphic on the left, I think that that's pretty um, eye-opening to us that sometimes we don't really calculate that. So the average number of feed, hay feeding days in Arkansas is about 135 days. A lot of you will probably start in uh, November and you're probably gonna feed all the way through February. There's several days there that you're going to be feeding. 
Um, you know that it, at the extension service, we like to push to 300 days of grazing. So to cut that down to only 65 days of having to actually feed hay, but our average here in Arkansas is 135. Uh, there are a few states that are higher than us. Uh, once again, thank God for Mississippi. There are 140 and Missouri is also at 140. Uh, we also know that Missouri is a little cooler than we are, so we'll give them that. Um, and then we also see that, you know, in dairy feeding states, that that can be high also. Um, and I wanted to just look over on the right hand side at the hay production cost. Um, you know, a lot of us don't even know what it costs to make a bell. So two bells per acre is probably a pretty good average. Um, and some of you may be getting four bells. I doubt very few of you are getting six bells per acre. Um, but if you're getting those, those are their costs. So basically anywhere from about $35 to $25. Um, is what it's going to cost us to make a bale of hay. So if it took you $35 to make a bale of hay and you're selling them for $40 a piece, right, there's just not much profit there. You're saying that all that time you invested is worth $5 a bale. Uh, surely your time is probably worth more than that. So it costs a lot to make hay. It costs a lot to buy hay. Um, I, I understand the security blanket of hay to know that it's in the barn and if I need it, I've got it. Um, you know, that's, that's really nice, it is. I can't argue that point, uh, but it is a cost that we could probably put down um, with winter annuals. And maybe winter annuals totally isn't what you wanna do, but it could be something where we, um, we, we lower our supplemental cost by allowing them to do some limit grazing in our winter annuals. And that might be something that, that works for you. So we're gonna talk about utilizing these cool season annuals um, in our operation. So one, they can be used in many different ways as hay, silage, pasture, or a combination. So let's just say we've got um, some ryegrass. It's the cheapest way to go. Uh, and we go through and we allow it to be pasture first. We allow our animals to graze it and it grows back and you might even be able to graze it one more time, allow it to come back and that third time, you're gonna make uh, probably hay out of it unless you have the equipment to do silage or haylage. Um, so that's a very popular thing. Um, it's a good quality uh, annual there. So it might be something that you do uh, a combination of these, or you may wanna just do some silage out of it. Uh, I know some guys that do a lot of silage. They they plant their winter annuals, and really they have hay season done before hay season even gets here for most of us. Uh, you can do, you can grow a lot of forage in April and May when there's really good water with these cool season annuals. Um, and you may have most of your stored forages put up and you just have to get one hay cutting and, and be kind of done and not have to worry about droughts. So maybe that's something that works for you. Small grains do make high quality hay when cut um, at the at the boot or the flag leaf stage. And annual uh, ryegrass should be cut by the early head stage. Uh, so remember that, don't let it go too far. Your quality is gonna go down. Uh, annuals can help pro producers decrease depend dependency on hay and silage. And that's kind of nice that, um, you know, go ahead and buy it, go ahead and plan on making some and put it in the barn but you may find that you didn't need as much. And then the next year you've got a little bit stacked away. So you don't have that pressure if something happens um, to get this amount of hay uh, done. Uh, you can also extend the value of rented land by growing forages in the winter months. You're, you're paying for them all year long, uh, but during the dormancy season, you're probably not utilizing them a lot because you don't wanna just put animals over there for sacrifice ground. So make it grow for you, uh, make it profitable to keep paying rental on that, at, that land. Uh, growing calves can easily gain two to two and a half pounds per day on wheat pastures, um, even more so if you, if you push them. And mature cows, uh, really just limit grazing is perfectly fine. And that's probably what a lot of you have is a cow-calf operation. So uh, just letting them go out there a couple of hours a day, get their belly full and, and take them off. Um, or maybe a couple of days a week, they are allowed to go and graze in that pasture. Uh, they don't ever 
graze it down until it's, you know, past the point of return. Uh, they get some growing time in between there and, and that might be something that really works for you and, and decreases the amount of supplementation you have to do. Um, so establishing warm season annuals, the planting date has a large influence on, on yield. The earlier, the better, obviously. So planting by the first week in September in a clean uh, tilled or a no-tilled crop field um, should allow grazing by the first week of November. There's not a lot of those fields in Pike County. A lot of you are waiting for your warm season grasses to go dormant. So uh, the second option there, if planting by the first week in October, uh, should allow you to start grazing in early December, maybe late November, just depending on our temperatures and our water. Uh, warm season grasses suppressed, uh, should be suppressed, sorry, if, if they're required to plant before that early October date. So if you plan on planting in September, uh, then you need to go out with about 16 ounces of glyphosate per acre and put that Bermuda to dormancy. It will not kill it. It will come back next spring. Um, I know that's a very scary thing to be spraying your uh, Bermuda with Roundup, uh, but it will put it into dormancy and you'll probably also do a little bit of weed control there. And then you can put your um, annuals out and not have to worry about that Bermuda growing back and choking it out. So when you're interceding into those warm season pastures, remember that um, they should be established by either no-till or a light disking. We have a huge problem in this county that there's not a, a no-till available to, to be rented. And so uh, you've got to either be clever there uh, because you don't want to put out a whole lot of cost. So let's just say if there's four of you, it's a $16,000 drill and there's four of you go in and put 4,000 down each um, and you share it, you probably don't need it um, all that long. You know, you, you take a couple of days and the next guy take a couple of days and, and you make it work, y'all can share it. Um, and I promise that it, that would be economically feasible to do your cool season annuals and even your summer annuals. So a cooperative type uh, buy-in might be something that would, would help you out. For a lot of you, just a light disking with a broadcast seeder is probably the way that you've got to go. And, uh, you know, there are some of these cool season annuals that do that better than others. Basically, the smaller the seed, the easier that's going to be. Uh, if you're grazing it, make sure that you graze it down to three to four inches before you plant in it or uh, go in after you've made that last cutting of hay uh, or bush hogged it to three or four inches. Spray with glyphosate once again if the temperatures are too warm. And uh, here's your seeding rates at the bottom. Um, for small grains, we recommend either uh, somewhere between 100 and 120 pounds per acre. Um, if you're broadcasting, you're going to have to go that heavy end. If you're no-till, you might get away with 100 or uh, somewhere in there. If you're doing ryegrass, about 20 pounds per acre is the recommendation. Um, and again, those dates are early October in North Arkansas, but for us here in uh, South Arkansas, Central Arkansas, mid-October uh, should get us uh, February grazing with ryegrass. Uh, this just kind of proves that point that suppression has to be done. Um, if you don't suppress, your dry matter will be uh, down quite a bit. So you see that in January when grasses were probably still growing and in September when these were, were planted versus that October plant, uh, suppression's not needed as much. Um, it still definitely helps, but it doesn't, uh, it might be a cost that, that you save because you do have your herbicide costs, uh, your cost of the fuel to run that tractor uh, so, you know, that might be something that you want to look at. It, it might be worth it to you to wait, uh, but there is a little decrease in dry matter if we wait uh, that extra month and plant in October versus September. So I'm going to go through um, each of the actual cool seasons that we uh, have around here and something that you might be able to use. So the first up is oats. They are extremely palatable. Cattle love to eat oats. Uh, they head out slightly later than wheat, so that gives you a little more time if you're looking at cutting this uh, for hay or for silage. It gives you a little more time in the spring uh, that you don't have to cut it, cut it quite as early. 
Uh, they do lack um, co-tolerance. So uh, I'm kind of in that border range. The north part of the county gets colder than the south part of the county. And we actually have um, two planning zones in Pike County. So just kind of know where you're at. If you're on top of the hill um, and you know you're going to get cold, keep that into consideration that there's just not a lot of cold tolerance in oats. They can um, have some frostbite on them and that can affect uh, yield. And they are susceptible to rust. Uh, so if you're looking for varieties, uh, that might be a, uh, a must have is rust resistance. Uh, I've put down a few different types of uh, oats that we look at, Ozark, Bob Oats, and Jerry Oats. Bob Oats and Jerry Oats are probably more popular. Um, and again, plan ahead because you're probably gonna have to ask somebody to order these around here. Uh, they probably aren't gonna keep them in stock. So again, plan ahead. Wheat um, is, uh, most wheat grown in Arkansas is the soft red winter wheat. Um, and once it's begun to head, um, regrowth potential is, is at minimum. So if you want it to have some regrowth, make sure that you graze it or cut it before that heading begins. Um, begin grazing at about six inches tall to up to uh, about a foot tall. Um, and then stop grazing it when the first hollow stem of grain production is desired. So uh, there's some resources that you can go to find that out, but uh, basically you'll cut the stem and you'll see where the seed head has, has begun. Uh, once that seed head has lifted above ground level, uh, you really risk those cattle eating the, the growing point out of that wheat. So we need to stop um, at that point so that it can uh, do some regrowth if grain production is what you desire. If you're not worried about grain production, then uh, just throw that out of there, <laughs> okay? Uh, can be grazed uh, and then regrowth can be harvested later on in April or May. Uh, Tritocale is something that's uh, a little bit newer, so it's a cross of wheat and rye. Um, honestly, I don't have much of this in the county, but it is highly palatable like wheat. Um, it has similar yields to rye, so it's, it has more yield than uh, wheat alone does. Uh, not as cold tolerant as rye. Uh, seed is expensive and it can be very hard to find. Uh, we have a hard time finding oats and wheat, so try, uh, this is gonna be a lot harder for us to find. Again, plan ahead if this is something you wanna do. You may have to drive a little while uh, to get try to cowling. Annual ryegrass is probably our most popular, uh, especially around here. Um, it is palatable, it's high quality and will reseed aggressively if you allow it to go to seed. It does mature later than small grains, which really helps us out because we can kind of get past some of those cold rainy times. Um, it's still gonna be wet in May, but we have more of a chance of it being a little bit higher temperature so that it actually dries out to be hay. Um, it is cost efficient and can be planted even in January or February as an emergency forage. Uh, does really well with prescribed burns. So, um, you know, you go through and, and spray everything with Roundup, do a kill and uh, burn it off and then plant in the ash. It does excellent with that. Uh, so you've got some options there. Uh, again, it does well with broadcasting. I would do a lot of seeding, uh, disc it, throw it out there, go over it with a harrow, and you really should have a pretty decent stand. Um, you know, just disking is not going to be um, as great of a stand as no-till, but still get a really good one. Some uh, key traits to look for are cold tolerance and rust resistance. So look at that when you're Considering varieties, uh, some of the common ones are Marshall, Jackson, Rustmaster. Um, they're all good varieties throughout the state. And you have some different varieties that we can plant here in South Arkansas that uh, probably wouldn't do so well in North Arkansas. We've got some pretty good publications on ryegrass if you need to look up more. And then I wanna talk about clovers. A lot of people wanna talk about uh, adding clovers um, they are a great resource for us to add a lot of nutrition there. Obviously, with the nitrogen fixation, they're very popular uh, for people to add back into their fields. There's a lot of people worried about spraying and what will I do to my clover? 
Uh, we actually have a clover demonstration planted this year at Hope at the Experiment Station, uh, Washita District Ag Agents. That's our project for the year. Um, I think it's going to be a really good one. We're looking at um, some new varieties too that are supposed to be a little more uh, hardy in wet zones. So we're really looking forward to that. Annual uh, or perennial is the way that clovers are divided. So you can have annual clovers and perennial clovers. Annual cl clovers, um, you, if you want them to come back, you need to make sure that you let them seed. Um, they do add nitrogen back to the soil, which is uh, something that a lot of people I really like the idea of getting free nitrogen. It puts it in the soil when you need it too. It puts it in the soil right before your warm season grasses uh, begin to uh, come out of dormancy and grow. They mix very well with other forages, uh, so they su supplement the gaps uh, well. You can put them out uh, at the same time as you do those small grains or that ryegrass, and they're going to do their thing and uh, complement those cool seasons. Uh, I've got some perennial and some annual varieties there that you might want to take note of. Um, we have the establishment. You do need to suppress weeds with a short residual such as 2,4-D or weed master. Uh, well in advance of the planting, um, I would do that a couple of, of months before um, and make sure that your soil pH is where it needs to be. Um, it, it likes a neutral soil. So if you're in that five point something range, you're going to need some lime out and you're going to need to, to raise it up. Really about 6.5 to 7 is where we want to be. Uh, so you really do need to do that. It takes, um, takes lime about six weeks uh, to penetrate to the uh, root zone and even more time than that would be uh, to your advantage. So if you think that you want to put out clovers, I would say make sure that you do that springtime soil test, get your results back, and then this summer, uh, make sure that you get that lime out and that it has plenty of time to actually change the pH in the root zone. Uh, that's really important with, with clovers that the pH is correct. Um, and then it can be broadcast or drilled. Uh, remember that clovers must be inoculated. They're probably going to be inoculated when you buy them. But if you're um, a little bit budget friendly and you're looking for the cheapest clover you can find, just make sure that it is inoculated. You do not want to plant in uh, clover that has not been inoculated. Um, and the bag will tell you whether it has or not. Plant by mid-November for uh, those of you here in South Arkansas. Uh, this is a really good chart that I, I think is, is awesome. Uh, this is in our clover uh, fact sheet. So you, you've got the common names, um, whether they're kind of a, a, sorry, a hay clover or a grazing clover, the seed rates, um, all those types of things, what the pH should be, um, and whether what kind of drainage they like. Um, as I said, we're, we're trying a new one, Balancia, um, at our trials this year at Hope that is supposed to work really well in poorly drained soils. So hopefully that will, will uh, be a good option that we can kind of go to. Uh, again, this is in the um, FSA for clovers. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk to you about brassicas. So a lot of people don't uh, really understand much about brassicas. It's kind of a weird word for us that we're not used to. Uh, so I've got those options of forage turnips, forage rape, um, and grazing radishes. These are a little bit different than what you plant for your greens in the cool season time. Um, those can work. They, they provide some forage yield, uh, but these uh, are particularly made for foraging. So you're probably gonna have a little more green up with these than you would just your typical turnips, radishes, right? Uh, so again, order early. I would plant these um, earlier than you would do a cool season. They can be drilled or broadcast. Again, a lot disking definitely helps. Um, apply about 60 pounds of nitrogen after you plant them, and then make sure that your P and K are good. So make sure you get a soil test. Um, you know, pH isn't as important here, but again, if we have less than a 5.8, it's probably gonna call for some lime. Uh, we'll take some time to develop a taste. So that's uh, what I mean is you're not gonna be able to just turn out 50 head 
on 40 acres of radishes and they just gobble it up. Uh, they're going to take some time to develop. This is a different taste. It's, it's a little bit more bitter than the grass is. So the palatability um, is an acquired taste. So what we suggest is make you a little patch, you know, a little uh, couple acre patch that you can throw the cattle in there, let them smell on it and, and eat on it and get a little bit used to it. They're going to trample some of it down. It's just going to happen. Uh, but you're not wasting a huge field out there. We have found that after frost that uh, the sugars change and apparently has a different taste and texture to it. Uh, so they do tend to eat it better after the first frost, but I would begin grazing them before then uh, because you're going to get a little bit of regrowth on it and uh, extend it out a little bit. So really good nutrition for um, late fall. I've got some numbers here to the uh right above me that, that talk about some of the crude protein and TDN and NDF that we find on these and excellent nutrition, uh, probably better than uh, what you're going to supplement with. Uh, just a few charts to kind of talk about what type of yield you could expect from a brassica. Uh, so you see that um, anything from, uh, you know, about 2,500 pounds per acre um, upwards to almost 5,000 pounds per acre is kind of what we have found on, on some of those um, trials that we've done. And then it, the other two talk about the regrowth. So these have been uh, grazed and then came back again. And so we've got a October grazing and then we have an early December grazing and do really well. Uh, most brassicas are not very cold tolerant. If you're in North Arkansas, it's, it's probably not going to have much regrowth. You're definitely going to get that October eating, uh, but December might not do as well for you. Here in South Arkansas, typically we don't have a frost that severe that is going to really um, kill these things out. Uh, may have some frost damage on them, but they're going to have some regrowth and you ought to be able to graze them twice. Um, so hopefully I can you can see how all of this kind of works together in that chart that we had at the very beginning on what is available when that especially these brassicas really fill in a gap you know and if you had that in combination with 20 acres of uh, stockpiled fescue or bermuda you know you could re really decrease the amount of hay that you're you're feeding uh, so everybody wants to know what kind of stocking rate are we talking about. A lot of times research gets the bad um, uh, opinion that it's an ideal world. Uh, so these stocking rates uh, weren't incredibly heavy. Um, and this was a 10 year study that we did at Hope at the Southwest REC. So uh, the stocking rate here was 500 pound calves and there was 1.2 acres per calf. Uh, and the forage was at a thousand pounds per acre. And that's about a five inch uh, plant height. Just kind of a rule of thumb is that there is 200 pounds dry matter for every inch of plant height. Uh, so usually we recommend about six inches before you start to graze this. Uh, so that would be a little more than what we have here. But anyway, this is about five inches of plant height is when they started to graze. And we're gonna wanna take them off uh, before they get lower than that three inch range typically, okay? Um, so delays in planting can have large effects on the, the grazing dates. The, lower you, the longer you wait to plant, the longer it is before you get to utilize them in, in grazing. And that ryegrass growth can be delayed, uh, can delay Bermuda growth in the spring. So you really wanna make sure that you get ryegrass off of those pastures um, in early May to mid-May. If you're waiting till Memorial Day to cut that ryegrass and get it off, honestly, you've waited too late um, and you will pay the consequence of delay in your Bermuda uh, because it's gone a few weeks without growing when everybody else did. Fertility, um, again, ideally, our pH should be about a six to a seven. 5.8 is about the lowest we can go. Lime does take several weeks before it can reach the root zone. So allow a couple of months before you, before you plant for that lime to take place. 
apply your fertilizer uh, to soil recommendation. And again, nitrogen only on actively growing warm season grasses or in actively growing cool season annuals. And you're probably going to want to do a, a second application in February as we begin to warm up on those small grains and ryegrass. Um, and ryegrass can actually um, take on a third application of nitrogen. So if you've uh, maybe grazed it twice and then you want the regrowth or you've cut it, uh, you can uh, possibly get out that third application of nitrogen to get that growth that you want. Um, but really I would probably stick to the two applications because I really think it's important to take it off uh, by mid-May. Here's kind of a, a really good graphic on the forage yield by month. So something that you can kind of expect. Uh, black is a September small grain. Uh, the light gray is a November small grain. The darker gray is a November ryegrass. Um, and then the, the other dark is in crop fields, uh, which were planted in February. Uh, so the first three are probably what you really want to pay attention to. So you can see there that really like a September small grain does really well, um, but there is a major difference between a September small grain and a November small grain. Uh, so just kind of uh, keep that in, in mind, okay? Uh, so just to summarize everything that we've talked about, uh, gaps do exist in our forage system. So uh, cool season annuals can fill in those gaps and allow us to uh, release our dependency upon hay. Grazing is typically more economical than forage, uh, stored forages, um, and it's also uh, better nutrition for us. Small grains can be utilized by November um, and last until the spring when our warm season grasses warm up, uh, start, start to grow, come out of dormancy. Ryegrass grows slower and can be utilized by February uh, all the way through May and then we need to get it off by mid-May. Clovers can add nitrogen to the soil, but we do need to watch for bloat, and that's why I believe a mix does really well, helps to control that bloat. Brassicas should be planted in August um, and can be grazed in October. And I've put down the fact sheets that I use to make our presentation for today. So fact sheet 3064 is for the cool season annuals, uh, 3137 is for establishing and, and maintaining clovers. And then FSA 61 is for brassicas. All of those can be found at uaex.edu or uh, contact your local county extension office and they can hook you up with a paper copy of that. Uh, if you have any questions, here are my contact information. I'd love to have you follow me on social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube is where uh, I post a lot of my stuff. And I also have a podcast, uh, a 20-minute podcast called Forages on the Go. That's once a month. And then the Pike County Extension Minute, uh, we try to do once a week, but uh, sometimes weeks don't allow us to do that. Uh, but those are simple, uh, about a minute and a half podcast. Uh, again, it's uh, been great to have you, and I hope that this information will help you make a decision on how you can fill in the gaps in your forage system.